Um, so how about uh, we open today's um, message with an embarrassing story? Sound good? Who wants to go first? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. Of course, I would never embarrass anyone um, else uh, with my stories. Totally a lie. Um, But today, uh, I will be the one uh, getting embarrassed. So here's my uh, embarrassing confession. Um, The first time Esther ever saw me naked, (laughs) she burst into hysterical laughter. (laughs) Let me explain. a second. <laughs> at, at her bachelorette party, all the married ladies um, were sitting around having a bit of a gripe fest about the way wedding night rituals usually play out. Um, the way they told the story, you know, the woman go into the bathroom to get all dolled up and the husband like slips under the covers where, you know, when she comes out, she's got to do the parade across the bedroom, but he's already like... Um, well hidden. And so they were all kind of complaining about this, uh, uh, about the awkwardness and, and embarrassment. And um, meanwhile, uh, the, the wives um, uh, told Esther, a few of them kind of thought about it and they said, you know what? Your husband might do it different. <laughs> like he might, there's some warning. Your husband might not be that shy type. Um, you know, so don't, don't be surprised. Um, if that doesn't work out that way. So Esther goes to the bathroom, gets all dolled up. She comes out and I'm standing there in my best Adam naked, none ashamed, superhero pose. And, and it, it, I'm completely naked. It triggered the conversation the night before and she busts up laughing. And I mean, talk about not the response you're expecting in that moment. <laughs> but we're talking this Lent series about what it might look like if Jesus had an Instagram account. And uh, we're titling this sermon, No Filter, hashtag no filter, which is the hashtag most people use when they're uh, trying to show things like a selfie or something with no makeup or, uh, or like they get such a perfect picture, they didn't even have to doctor it up. And, and uh, so basically no filter means you're getting the bare naked truth. Um, and last week we talked about Jesus's Instagram moment at the Jordan River. Uh, we discussed uh, his baptism, his time in the wilderness, and how it related to the beginning of his ministry. Um, it was as if Mark snapped one of those first day of school pictures um, uh, to note the way that Jesus began to work, began his work as a traveling rabbi. Um, we also talked about how important it is for us to mark our beginnings, especially those that have spiritual significance. Um, we need to mark and share those moments where we see more. Um, we may not be like Jesus where he came out of the water and he saw the heavens torn open and God's voice come booming down at him. But there are times when we see how thin this reality really is. The times when we can just feel God's kingdom right here, right now. And it's impar- important that we mark those moments and that we, uh, and especially that we share them. And especially those moments where we know in our hearts, like Jesus heard the voice of God say, you're my beloved child. I'm well pleased in you. When we feel that in our hearts, we know we, that we know that we know that we're God's beloved child and he's pleased with us. We need to, to hold those, mark those and share those. Um, well, this week we'll be scrolling to Jesus's next post. And this one happens in Mark chapter nine. If you wanna follow along, we're gonna read uh, verses two through nine. Now the, the words will also be on the screen. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James and John and led them to a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful us to be, for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say. They were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone and they saw only Jesus with them. And they went back down the mountain and he told them to tell, not to tell anyone uh, until, not to tell anyone what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. 
So this is the famous um, Mount of Transfiguration story. And wow, um, if there has ever been an Instagram like worthy moment, it's this one. Can you imagine uh, Peter, James, and John if they lived in the age of, of smartphones? I mean, this is definitely one of those group selfies with Jesus glowing in the background moments. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is postable, hashtag no filter. Um, this is a really fun passage um, for how short it is because uh, there's a lot packed into these seven verses. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of work through the nerd stuff first um, because I'm a nerd and I love that stuff. Um, and then we'll talk about what this actually means to us today. Um, we're not necessarily, necessarily going to go verse by verse because I don't feel like verse by verse really does this passage justice, but uh, we'd have to double back a whole bunch. So we're going to kind of work theme by theme through this. Um, so the first thing we want to notice is that this passage mostly points backwards. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a passage where when we look at it, we see that this is really about that. And we're going to unpack that a little bit. The first person to take it backwards is Peter. He says, then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So before I get to the real teaching here, um, can we just agree that Peter is awesome? Like, I totally get Peter. I mean, who in the world speaks in this moment? Like, who says anything here? G Jesus just turned into a light bulb, and maybe even crazier for a first century Jew is that two of the greatest heroes in the Old Testament suddenly show up. And, uh, and if there was ever a moment to be speechless, this is it, except not for Peter. You know, anyone else a nervous talker? Do we have any nervous talkers in here where when you get anxious, you cover it with a bunch of words? Yeah, me too. I mean, verse six even tells us why Peter spoke. He said this because he didn't know what else to say, <laughs> for they were completely terrified. Any of those people who, when you have no idea what to say, you just say something like, I'm one of those people. Yeah, when, I'm, when I don't know what to say, I still manage to find words. I just, I, f I fill it up. Hashtag my people. Um, so rather, than, rather than, than just witnessing, than just watching, which is obviously why Jesus brought them up there. I mean, he's, for, for all intents and purposes, he's ignoring them. He brought them up and then he turns to talk to Elijah and Moses. So clearly their purpose for being there is to see this, you know, and... and Peter, James, and John um, are supposed to kind of bear witness to this incredibly eschatological event, um, but Peter draws attention to himself by, by speaking, and I can totally relate. But the real thing I want to look at here um, is where this event takes Peter's mind. Uh, he says this, <clears throat> uh, let's make three shelters. Uh, let's make three shelters. I say all the time that when we study the Gospels that first century Jews usually would read particular passages and considerably different than we might read them. Um, their minds would be drawn to certain things and certain phrases automatically. Um, references to numbers and things would take their minds somewhere else. It would, it would say, this is about that. They would hear the number 40, the number seven, the number 12. When they would hear these things, they would say, oh, this is a story about that back there. And, would, and it would remind them because they had this deep historical and cultural context built into the stories. Well, this passage is one of those times where we get to see it actually play out. Peter's standing on a mountain. He sees the glory of God. He sees Moses and Elijah. And immediately Peter goes back into his mind about this story that he's heard a thousand times about how the glory of God came down on a mountain called Mount Sinai. So what does Peter do with this reference? We well, moves to the next scene of the Mount Sinai story. And he says, let's make some tabernacles. Because when God came down on the mountain and Mount, Mount Sinai, that was the next move. They made tents to live in. Now, the first thing we have to establish is Peter's day, tents were not memorials. By Peter's day, there was big buildings, there was temples. Um, so uh, for Peter to choose tents as his memorial would have been a fairly unique thing. So for Peter to offer to build tents marks a couple things. It tells us two main things. First, Peter has taken this moment backwards. He's not thinking, he's not just swallowing this moment. He's saying, hey, this is about something else. This is about something I remember. He goes backwards with it. He sees a reference to and a fulfillment of past scripture, which is important. The reason for this is probably based 
In this struggle they had with the second temple, we see this a lot in Jesus's life, that he, that he had a conflict with the temple. And several of the prophets um, around the time Israel was sliding downhill toward destruction, prophesied about the fall of God's people. He, they knew that Israel was going to be overthrown and that the temple was going to be um, sacked. And so several of them, um, hundreds of years before it happened, prophesied of a day when God would allow the temple to be rebuilt. They start talking about, and this is before the te- temple's even been torn down. They start saying, but there's going to come a day when God rebuilds this temple and builds things back up again. He allows the city of David to be restored. But then a couple of prophets, not very many, but a couple of them also captured that there would be something off in this second temple, that things wouldn't be quite right. It wouldn't be quite the same as the first one. Uh, It would not serve the people of God and the world the way it was intended to. And by the time uh, of Jesus, the temple had become this highly political um, I didn't want to get into the history uh, because it would take forever, but in, this, in, the, in the time between the two Gospels, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a lot of conflict in Israel. And the temple became this highly political element that people fought over. Who's going to lead the temple? It became economically driven. And we see Jesus complaining about that. When he goes to the temple, you've, uh, you're, you're making a profit off of God's people. And he turns tables and, and, uh, and gets upset about it. Um, and the prophets had picked up on this. A couple of the prophets had picked up on this. According to first century authors, several first century historians, one of the most often quoted scriptures in Jesus' day was Amos 9-11. That reads like this, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. They're talking about the future. He's saying this is, this is in the, the future. On that day, I'll raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repairs it, it and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. The tabernacle of David is kind of weird. We don't really talk about that much in the Old Testament. We don't really know what it is, but it refers to this tent that David built when he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. They didn't have a temple yet. David was saving up resources to build a temple and he didn't have it. So he put the, the Ark of the Covenant in a, in a fixed place, but in this movable tent. And for some reason, God says, there's going to come a day when I'm going to put my presence in, this, in the tabernacle of David, this movable tent that, that goes with people. And so in Peter's day, many of the Jews who were struggling with what the temple had become started clinging to this verse in Amos where they were like, the temple's not really where God is anymore. He's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. And so they look forward to a day when God would abandon the, the solid temple and rebuild his tabernacle of David. So when Peter sees Jesus glowing and Moses and Elijah all standing on this high mountain, he makes this connection and says, let's build a tabernacle. That's what we need to do. This is the time. So he looks back and he sees something. He said, this must be that. Let's build tents. So when Peter sees Jesus is glowing, that's where his mind goes. And this is important because Jesus has to be more than just awesome for a first century Jew. I mean, for most of us, if we saw a person like transform and turn on the like LEDs in their body, um, that's all we need. Whatever they're selling, I'm buying. Like that dude is awesome. You know, whatever he stands for, that's what I, that's what I want. He just went full 100 watt bulb on me. I don't care what he's selling, I'm on board. Like most of us look at the miracle as, as just evidence that this guy's awesome and that's all that really matters. But Peter, it's, it's not important that Jesus is powerful and glorious, that's cool, but that's not what is important. He, he can't just be a powerful, glorious guy, he has to be the right guy. He has to be the guy that fulfills everything that's already been said and that's hugely important to a Jew, you know, because they have stories of awesome guys. The Bible, the Old Testament's full of awesome guys. They need the right guy. And so for Jesus to show up and point to an old story and fulfill an old story, now Peter's going, this must be the right guy. He fits. But Peter isn't the only one that takes it backwards. Peter starts it, but after that, it goes like this. Then the cloud overshadowed them. And the voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Now, I've always wondered if... If God did the cloud and voice thing to humor Peter because Peter brought up the tabernacles, or if Peter just somehow caught where this is going before it actually went there. But, um, 
But after God, uh, God takes it straight back to Sinai also. Peter did it first with the tabernacles. God goes right back there too. After God had delivered the children of, of Israel from Egypt and taken them through the Red Sea, they gathered around Mount Sinai. And it says that a cloud descended on the mountain and God spoke to the people from the cloud. And it says that Moses went up into the mountain to speak with God and when he came back out, his face was shining so bright that people couldn't even look at it. So they had to cover it with a veil. So this is, this is a throwback story. Like as Peter sees this and he sees Jesus shining and he knows they're on a mountain and he sees a cloud and he hears a voice, he was like, this is that story. We're living in that story. So whether God did this to, to, to go along with Peter's reference or Peter grasped exactly what was happening, we're not sure, but this is clearly pointing to the Exodus story. And I believe there's a reason um, that this story goes back and it's found in what God says from the cloud. It says, then the cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son, listen to him. Now, as a modern Christian, this would be enough. This is all we need. Listening to someone who just started glowing um, and was validated by a big booming voice coming from a cloud would just be natural. Listening to him would be natural. Who else am I gonna listen to than, than this guy? Clearly this is God's son. Clearly I have no choice but to listen to him. I mean, the dude just lit up. So basically we would put the import on the fact that God just audibly claimed Jesus as his son. That's the most important thing that God said, this is my son. To a Jew, this reads a little differently. Uh, they would put weight on this last phrase, listen to him. Because Mark frames this in the, in the exact format um, of this verse. It says, where'd I go? Moses continued, the Lord your God will raise up among you a prophet like me. This happens all the way back in the wilderness in the Exodus story. The Lord your God will raise up among you a prophet like me from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. Mark actually chooses the same words the, that, that, that Moses uses. You must listen to me. And now the voice comes from the heaven, listen to him. This is, very full, proud. This is a, a very profound messianic verse to a Jew. To this day, Jews who wait for the Messiah um, are waiting for a servant like Moses. They hang on to that verse. They talk about it every Passover. They're, hang, they're waiting for that prophet who is like Moses. And Moses said, when he comes, you will listen to him. And, and Peter, James, and John hear this voice coming from heaven going, listen to him. This is going back to that verse in Deuteronomy. It's, it's the very top of the quoted verses um, about this eternal king that's coming to Israel. So for, for the voice that Peter and James and John hear to say, this is my son, listen to him, it would have felt like an immediate throwback to Deuteronomy, to this Exodus sto story. So for Peter, James, and John, this moment, seeing Jesus in his glory, seeing Moses the deliverer, seeing Elijah the forerunner of the Messiah, the cloud from heaven, the booming voice, naming Jesus to be a prophet like Moses. This is clearly a massive validation that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. And this seems like it would be awesome, right? This seems like who wouldn't want rock solid proof that this is the Messiah? I mean, we live in the days of atheists and apologetics and people who feel like they have to defend the faith. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just have this experience? Wouldn't it be great if we could just see a cloud and hear a voice and have God answer all of our questions? This is the guy. Follow him. Well, as it turns out, that's not exactly all that helpful. See, this is the same Peter who knows for a fact now that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's the same Peter that completely misses the point and pulls a sword out and tries to fight when Jesus' arresters come. This Peter, who saw everything we dream of seeing and heard a voice that we long to hear, still saw Jesus arrested and he denied three times that he even knew him. This Peter, who's ready to build tabernacles because he is so sure that this is the fulfillment of everything he had been looking for, watched Jesus die. 
and, and then went back to fishing. Like it was all over, like it all meant nothing. He returned to his career because I obviously had it wrong. See, Peter saw Jesus as the Messiah, but that doesn't mean he understood what that meant exactly. In fact, I think Mark puts the story where he does on purpose. See, the story that goes right before this, and we actually have to go back into chapter 8 if you're following in your Bible, but remember the chapters and verses were added years later, so this would have read like one straight long story. So the passage immediately before this reads like this. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began reprimanding him and saying, uh, and saying for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowds to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more, worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, doesn't this seem weird? That basically in back-to-back -back stories, Peter completely denies Jesus as Jesus kind of self-discloses who he is. And then immediately after that, he sees Jesus in his glory and he's ready to put up memorials to that fact on the spot. And of course, it's not really that weird when you look at, at the Jesus that Peter was reacting to in each passage. I mean, who would not be on board with a Jesus who is shiny and hanging out with your heroes? Who doesn't love mountaintop Jesus? Who doesn't love Jesus when your prayers are being answered and the whole world makes sense and Caleb is rocking your soul and everyone you talk to, I love to make fun of Caleb. And everyone you talk to cannot wait to hear about Jesus. Who wouldn't want to build a tabernacle in that moment? But let's be honest. That's not, that, I mean, that's the Jesus we're usually sold, right? <laughs> Samuel's trying to get my attention back there again. They're having a lot of fun in kids. Okay, let's all take one moment and look at Samuel. They're all having a blast in children's church. <laughs> He's playing the cloud that came down on the mountain. <laughs> but mountaintop Jesus is the Jesus we're sold. I mean, let's be, let's be completely real and completely authentic here for like one minute. If I came up here on stage and I said to you, if any of you wants to be a Jesus follower, follower, you can no longer do what you want. You have to embrace horrendous suffering and follow Jesus. If you try to hang on to your life, it's too late. You lost it. But if you completely give up your life for Jesus' sake and the sake of the gospel, you'll be saved. Oh, and by the way, if you're ashamed of Jesus and his message in these kind of modern sinful days, Jesus will return the favor when he comes back. Who wants to be saved? Who's on board? Come on, let's sign up. I mean, can you understand why, why Peter is having a hard time with this Jesus? Why just a few days before, Peter is like, this is not going to happen. I am not on board with this Jesus. Who in the world wants to take up your cross, Jesus? Who's dying to follow, give up your life, Jesus? No, thank you. I'll take mountaintop Jesus, please, and thank you. I mean, let's be real. Peter stands for all of us in this passage. Every single one of us wants to walk away from chapter 8 with a sick feeling in our guts. And the moment we saw shiny Jesus, we would do exactly what Peter did. Right here, this moment, this mountaintop, this Jesus is the Jesus I want. Let's build a tabernacle right here, right now, and never leave this mountain. This is it. 
No cross for me, just neon Jesus and Moses who called down plagues and parted seas and Elijah who called down droughts and called down fire and raised the dead. We're going to leave Job and Jonah and Jeremiah down in the valleys. Who needs those guys? I'm staying up here with the miracle workers. We all do this. We fill sermons with mountaintop stories and we quote verses like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we assume any time things aren't mountaintop-ish, I don't know if that's a word, that something is wrong or off. We wonder where God is and why he's abandoned us. Esther and I got uh, dated and got married in a mountaintop moment. It was this incredible and miraculous move of God. We originally met at a mutual friend's house for lunch the very first time we got together and and uh, we went back to that same apartment after our first date, and we all hung out and had a Bible study. And, and, uh, and, and the Bible study just kind of spontaneously broke out, really, um, in the midst of this Bible study. Butch, my, who would soon be my mentor, kept making these statements that everyone seemed to understand, and it was like all Greek to me. I didn't get any of it. I was completely ignorant of, of anything. And uh, I mean, he, was, he kept talking about Jews. And I was like, hey, you keep saying Jews. What's a Jew? And he was like, a Jew. <laughs> I was like, no, not getting it. He was like, the children of Abraham. I was like, Abraham. He was like, oh my gosh, like this kid knows nothing. <laughs> and so he was like, you know what? We got to go back to the beginning. So he was like, let's go to the beginning of your Bibles. And so he just kind of started teaching. And, and so I came back the next night and I had dinner with him. And I was like, dude, teach me something new. And he, so after dinner, he got out his Bible and, and he started teaching. And the, and the day after that, you know, we, we just kept moving on. And, and then he was like, hey, you need to memorize this verse. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You need to go memorize this verse. So I went home immediately and memorized this verse. And the very next day after I put this verse in my head, I'm in, I'm in college and I noticed this girl that I chatted with in class a couple times was really kind of acting depressed and went up and asked what was going on. And she was like, you know, you know tell me what's going on. I was like, you need to follow Jesus. And she, she was like, I, I love you, but I got these questions. And she asked me three questions and all three of them were answered in that verse that I memorized. If she had asked me a fourth, I was done. I, I, used, I used every bit of knowledge I had in that moment. And, and I led her to Christ. We prayed together. She started following Jesus. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, because I kept going back every single night. I want to learn more. I want to learn more. Butch years later told me that he would drive home from work. He was a, an alarm installer and he would be on his way home from work. And he said he would pray, God, I can't answer one more of this kid's questions. I'm out, I'm tapped. I got nothing else. If he asked me one more question tonight, I'm done. And he'd walk in the door and I would be like, oh dude, like before he was even in the door, I was reading my Bible today and I've got about six questions. And he would be like, okay, get your Bible out. And before long, there was like 20 or 40 people showing up for dinner every single night. And Butch would get out his Bible and we would study together. And, and it, it led into the season where people were getting saved and we were doing life together. And, and, uh, and Cindy was filling her table full of food and, and humans and people were getting healed. And every single one of us was going around telling everybody we could bump into about Jesus. And we were having these long three. years of my life trying to recreate that. Feeling like something was drastically wrong with the church and with me and with America and with Esther and with God because I loved the mountaintop and I wanted it back. I was miserable. If I'm honest, I was angry and dissatisfied. I wanted to set up camp right there on the mountaintop and never come down. I did exactly what Peter did. This is why I love the Bible. These people here, once you spend a little bit of time with them, are so real. Peter is so human here. If Peter was all zen and cool when he heard Jesus talking about his own death or how his followers were going to have to suffer, or even if he was like chill about seeing Jesus on the mountaintop, I'd have a real hard time relating to him. But Peter acts incredibly real here. He completely rejects the valley. 
and is 100% ready to set up camp on the mountaintop. I think I'd get along with Peter just fine. And I think there's a simple beauty to what God says to Peter, James, and John on the mountain. He says, this is my son. Not an idea, not a theological concept, not a political platform. This person with the parts you like and the parts you'd rather not think about is my son. This guy who said, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I'll give you rest is my son. So is the guy who said, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows and take up your torture and execution device and follow me. That's also my son. My son is almost indiscriminately forgiving of sins. And my son talks about hell more than any other person in the Bible. This is my son when he's healing lepers and raising people from the dead. And he's still my son when he's telling Peter that Satan is getting ready to sift him like wheat and he's going to let it happen. He's just going to pray that his faith doesn't give up. That's also my son. This is my son. Take him as he is or don't take him at all. But he will not fit in your box. As soon as you try to co-opt him into your party, he'll stand for something that you stand against. While we're quoting, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That verse we all love so much. Jesus is hearing the verse before that. I know how to live with nothing or everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether I have a full stomach or a completely empty one. With plenty or with little, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At this point in Mark's gospel, Peter isn't ready for that yet. Peter wants the mountaintop, but not the valley. He wants the glory, but not the cross. We're calling this sermon no filter, hashtag no filter. I'd love to say that what happens on the mountaintop, on the Mount of Transfiguration, was Jesus' no filter selfie. As if he finally lets Peter, James, and John see him without makeup. Like everything off the mountain was him kind of disguising himself as human. This is the real Jesus. And actually, to be honest, that was my plan. That was where I thought I was going with this sermon. But as I studied and I wrote, I realized that Jesus was just as authentic on the cross as he was on the mountaintop. And if you want real Jesus, you have to be ready to accept both. So how do we respond to this? It'd be so easy in Mark 8 to make fun of Jesus for rebuking, or Peter for rebuking Jesus. Peter was like, this will never happen. And Jesus, I mean, Jesus called him Satan. Holy moly, talk about missing it, right? When, when your Savior calls you Satan. And we can try to be academic about it and analyze Peter's theological inconsistencies I think it's better that we just own that we are Peter. How many of us had a hard time and we, we rebuke Satan for the valley we found ourselves in without even wondering if maybe this was the work of the one who, who told us there would be a cross in our future? How many times have we missed it? The darkest time in my adult life was, was hell. For me, it was the closest thing to hell I can imagine. Felt at times like it was absolutely Satan at work. I would never in a million years want to go through that again. Brutal. Literally only the grace of God got us through. And looking back, as much as I hated that season of life, every good thing in my life right now was built on the lessons I learned there. The way we rebuilt out of that valley. And now I actually, on a regular basis, thank God for that season of my life. I believe with all my heart, I called the work of God the work of Satan. Talk about missing it. 
How in the world am I going to judge Peter? Brett and Lena this week asked Brett for permission to do this. So Lena yell at him, not me. Lena had two brutal weeks after her last chemo treatment. It was, it was hell. It was hell. She was on bottom. Did not recover. You know, normally you have a couple bad days and you start to climb back up. Did not recover. Deep valley. Deep enough that they, they went to the, to the doctor and when Lena first went in, her cancer markers were at 100. After her first batch of chemo rounds, it went all the way down to 78. Your average person without cancer is 2.5. 2 they were like, that's not enough. So they put her on a brutal plan to attack it. Recovered from the surgery, they put her back on chemo, and she does not respond well. Terrible. Where is God? Why has he abandoned me? So bad, they went back to the doctor and said, we got to find a new plan. So they ran some tests and found that her cancer markers are at two. <laughs> Sorry about that. If she had not gone through hell, she would not have walked in that doctor's office and demanded that test. Real easy to blame those two weeks on Satan. But we get to stand here and go, her numbers are at two. We're all feeling on a mountaintop right now. So the first way I would love to respond to this message is to let Jesus out of whatever box he might have him in. If you're a take up your cross person, if you're a I'm ready for the hard times person, please know that Jesus is also shiny, mountaintop, healing, crazy, miracle working, signs and wonders, raising the dead Jesus also. And if you're a praise Jesus, the Lord is mighty, mountaintop person, please know that Jesus is also the one that went to the cross and promised you would do the same. If you are a son and daughter of the king type, please know that, you know, one of those, I am royalty in Jesus. Please know that Jesus also washed feet. If you're a, I'm serving the least of these type, please know that Jesus also said, go and announce the kingdom is near, heal the sick, raise the dead, cure leprosy, cast out demons. You go do all these amazing things because you're, now, full of the Holy Spirit. If you're a conservative, I promise you, Jesus is far more liberal than you are comfortable with. And if you're a liberal, I, can, I guarantee you, Jesus is conservative enough to frustrate the heck out of you. Please, please take Jesus out of the box and try to take him for who he is. Dive into the Gospels this Lent season. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Start reading them. They don't take long. A couple of times during Lent season. And look for the places where Jesus makes you uncomfortable. Where he says something that you don't get or he frustrates you. And every time you hit one of those places, hear the voice from heaven go, this is my son. This one that just said something that you don't like is my son. Don't put him in a box. The second way I would love to the, respond to this message today is to offer that same acceptance to the body of Christ. Everyone in this room is capable of horrible sin. And with God's help, we are all also capable of an incredible amount of good. We are all sinners and we are all Christ followers, redeemed children of God. We cannot except just the parts we like. Authenticity means you're going to see the stuff that inspires you to greatness and draws you closer to Jesus and the stuff that frustrates you and makes you wish that the Holy Spirit would move a little bit quicker in the sanctification process. <laughs> 
Loving someone means loving all of them as they are. This is Chris. The unbelievably brilliant and stunningly handsome Chris. (laughs) And the deeply broken daily sinner. Don't you dare love me as a pastor and reject me as a father who still comes home and yells at his kids sometimes just because he had a bad day at work and has nothing to do with the kids because I'm weak. And, and, and the Chris who still gets in debates where he's arrogant and condescending. I am not all bad, but I'm certainly not all good. And neither are you. And neither is the person next to you. When Jesus went no filter, it means that he was the Jesus of the mountaintop and the Jesus of the cross. When you and I go no filter here at Open Table, I mean, sometimes we're gonna get it right. We're gonna love each other well. Sometimes we'll show up and we'll encourage each other and we'll carry each other's burdens and we're gonna do a good job of representing the kingdom of God. And sometimes we're gonna miss it. Sometimes we're gonna say things that hurt. Sometimes we're gonna overlook each other. Sometimes we're gonna fail to show up. If we go no filter, sometimes we're going to go deep into worship of our king and we're going to pray deeply until the heavens move and we're going to believe for miracles until we see them happen and we're going to walk in the truth that God reveals to us as we tirelessly advance his kingdom and we're going to fail. We're going to get lazy. We're going to get selfish. We're going to make it all about us. We're going to say things we shouldn't and we're going to give in to moments of weakness. If you only love your church family when they're on the mountaintop, you will often be disappointed and your love will be very fickle. And if you come here expecting nothing but sin and a bunch of sinners, you'll miss some of the most amazing works of God that ordinary people can do. We must take each other as we find each other. Beauty marks and warts the glory of the mountain and the muck and mire of the valley. And of course, there's a catch to this. In order for this to work, you have to come as you are. You have to be willing to show people the real you. You have to be willing to show up as both sinner and saint. You have to be you, the whole you, the real you. Hashtag no filter. None of us get to wait under the covers while everybody else struts around the room authentically. If we're going to take each other as we are, it means we all get naked. Metaphorically, don't make it weird. (laughs) It's only weird if you make it weird. So for the rest of us this Lent season, as you fast, as you face the wilderness, dive into the Gospels and take Jesus as you find him even when he doesn't fit into your boxes. And as you do, extend that same grace to the people around you. Take them as you find them. Work hard to love the parts that you don't like and the parts that frustrate you. It doesn't mean you condone sin or bad behavior. It means that you own that you love a sinner, not just a saint. I can promise you, if you want to love me, you have to love both. I believe with all my heart that goes for everyone else in this room. And those joining online as well. Amen.